so continuing with the four establishments of mindfulness, we talked about the body and one of those practices, the parts of the body was in the original version of the sutta. Vedana was also one of the original practices. And today's topic, which is contemplation of citta is also one of the original practices. The Pali word citta is usually translated as mind, but probably more accurately translated as heart mind. The citta is that organ in the center of your chest that is the seat of your thoughts and emotions, at least the uh, understanding at the time of the Buddha. As I said, the brain is just the marrow of the skull. In Pali, like in a number of Asian languages, there's not the distinction made between thoughts and emotions. They're just mental activities. And the citta is the source of that. But in the West, you know, we, we sort of separate mind and heart. The citta actually combines the two. But in the third establishment of mindfulness, really what's being talked about is mind states. I'll read you what it says. And how does one abide contemplating mind states as mind states? Here, one knows a lustful mind as lustful. A mind free from lust is free from lust. A hating mind is hating. A mind free from hate as free from hate. A deluded mind is deluded. An undiluted mind is undiluted. A contracted mind is contracted. A distracted mind is distracted. A developed mind is developed. An undeveloped mind is undeveloped. A surpassed mind is surpassed. An unsurpassed mind is unsurpassed. A concentrated mind is concentrated, an unconcentrated mind is unconcentrated. A liberated mind is liberated, an unliberated mind as unliberated. So this list is not, it's not exhaustive. There are other mind states possible. You know, you could be bored. You could be, well, you probably can come up with lots of different mind states. So this is examples. It's a collection. And the first three are a mind with greed, hatred, and delusion, or without greed, hatred, and delusion. Then we have contracted and distracted. The commentaries say contracted with sloth and torpor and distracted through restlessness. Yeah, that's good. It could be contracted into one-pointedness, and distracted into distractions. So as, since these are examples, I don't think it's necessary to come up with a definitive explanation of it. It's more about knowing what your state of mind is. Developed and undeveloped, the commentaries say developed through jhana. Uh, surpassed and unsurpassed. Can you do better than this? Or is this the absolute best that can be done? And again, the commentaries think it's the jhanas. Concentrated and unconcentrated. Yeah, commentaries are definitely two and jhanas there. And then liberated and unliberated. The commentaries say liberated from the hindrances. I think it actually applies to fully liberated, totally awakened. But yeah, the list is examples. And so what you need to do is keep checking in what's your state of mind. I would say when you sit down to meditate, check in and notice what your mind state is. Are you agitated? Are you angry? Are you wanting something? Just just check your mind state. And also when the bell rings and you're ready to get up, you might check your mind state again there. This is not a particularly useful practice to do, you know, for a 45 minute period. I mean, you'd sit down and go, yeah, not concentrated. Yep, still not concentrated. Yep, still not concentrated. I I don't think that's going to be very useful. But it's a really good practice to do off the cushion. Like all of the other practices, one does it internally and externally. Okay, so yeah, you've got to have the supernormal power to know the minds of others. Or sometimes you can infer somebody else's mind state. 
you know, if you see them turning red in the face, shaking your finger, shaking their finger at you and making a lot of noise, you can you know, figure out angry mind state, right? But the important one is a rising and passing of mind states. How many different states of mind are you in in a day? Can you notice when your mind state changes from one to another? And can you notice what triggered the change? This, this is really good. Important to, to notice this. And thus, there are, our mind states is known sufficiently for mindfulness. Not a terribly complicated practice. If the mind state you find is unwholesome, then you apply the four great efforts. The first two make the whole unwholesome mind state go away. And if it's wholesome, encourage it, bring it around to perfection. And that's more talked about in the fourth establishment of mindfulness, which we'll get to after we take a look at if you have any questions. How does one detect that they're in a deluded mind? Yeah, how do you take, detect if you're in a deluded mind state? Because <laughs> if you're deluded, you're deluded about the fact you're deluded. Uh, we seem to have that problem with a lot of people these days. Usually you can only really detect it when you come out of it. In other words, you've got this deluded idea or whatever, and then reality smacks you upside the head and says, no, it's not like that. And then you can go, oh, yeah, I was deluded. So the ability to admit, oh, I was deluded is really important because, yeah, most people want to think they're perfect. You know, I get it right all the time. And uh, being strong enough to go, yeah, I, I had that wrong. Uh, I see the error of my ways. Is This actually requires, yeah, uh, requires a certain amount of mental strength and a certain amount of confidence in who you are, even though that may kind of shake your confidence. But yeah, detecting, yeah, I'm just wandering around in a deluded state now. Yeah, it's really hard. knowing when you're deluded. And I, I, I was thinking one of the marks to, for me to pay more attention to is when there's a really strong self, strong sense of um, self. Mm -hmm. Seems that's usually not a good place to be. Usually delusion in there. Right. When the ego has gotten loose and is running wild, it's a really good setup for acting deluded. Yeah. And so uh, can you be in a place where you're fully inhabiting whatever's going on without your ego being out there asserting who you are, what you are, and <laughs> being a target for getting bruised? When your ego is out there like that, yeah, there's, there's a good chance that delusion might be happening. I have a question which um, kind of follows up on what was already asked, but it has to do with uh, this idea of psychological bypass, uh, spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to list any names, but there are plenty of examples of supposedly really spiritual teachers way along the path who you would imagine supposedly should their moral failing should be at the most minor, but you actually see often them doing just atrocious things. I'm not so interested in perspective on them. I'm just mainly interested in how can we on our path kind of do our best to not engage in this kind of spiritual bypassing type of uh, thing. I mean, there's, you know, in Western psychology, this idea of subconscious, you got to figure out what's going on down there. And how do these two things kind of come together? Yeah, spiritual bypassing is definitely a problem. I have run into students who 
clearly had psychological issues they needed to work on and they were avoiding working on anything because they were busy being spiritual just to keep it at bay and it doesn't go very well. So one of the things is pay attention to your intentions. Why are you doing this? What are you hoping to get out of it? And that can be very helpful. Measuring, all right, is this ego-centered or is this actually something helpful that I'm doing? So that's one of the things that can be helpful. Two, is there anything you seem to be pushing away? All right, the, the pushing away is certainly a good sign of that it's possible to be doing spiritual bypassing. One of the problems, however, comes when you're trying to generate concentration. You're to push everything away, right? You're to abandon the hindrances temporarily. So when you're pushing stuff away, is there something that keeps coming up, maybe in the same sit, but shows up in every sit, particularly if it shows up in every sit? This is something that needs to be looked at. You don't have to stop the meditation at that point to look at it, but you should remember, okay, I'm pushing away this, whatever it is, I need to come back to this at some point. And actually coming back to it after you've gotten concentrated is a really good time because your ego is not so involved. And you can look at whatever this thing that is persistent that keeps coming up and then you have to keep pushing away. So those are a couple of suggestions. The, the really paying attention to your motivation uh, is essential in so many areas. The other thing is to have noble friends with whom you can have noble conversations. And in particularly, the best friend is one who, when you do something stupid, will tell you, you know, that was really pretty stupid. And so they, they won't let you hide your shadow or something. They, they, they call it out. And so finding friends like that is really, really important. And it's a fine line between somebody who can call you out and be helpful and somebody who's calling you out because it builds them up and they don't really care whether they're being helpful or not. So you've got to look out for those people as well. It's not just anybody who calls you out. It's someone who has your best interest at heart when they call you out. So following on from, from that question about spiritual bypassing, um, one of the things that struck me about the four great efforts is that in a sense, they could be quite a good setup for spiritual bypassing. If something negative comes up that you don't want to experience, so you swat it and you push yourself over to a positive state so you don't have to deal with it. Um, could you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this definitely could be a problem if you are just pushing everything out of the way. All of these techniques, none of them are absolute. You know, you've got to look at the context and what's going on in there. And yeah, sometimes there's just a, a real tendency to want to push the stuff that's negative out of the way and not deal with it. It can be very helpful, though, to keep track of what's the negativities that are coming up frequently. I find myself getting angry at my least favorite politician. All right. Am I spiritual bypassing when I push that away? Probably not. Probably just trying to chill myself out here because, yeah, there's nothing I can really do about my least favorite politician except vote against him, which I did. So you really got to look at the bigger context as well. But you also don't want to go get lost in all the negativity that comes up. There can be psychological indulgence as opposed to spiritual work. And so people are told to examine, you know, any negative states that come up. And so anger comes up. And so they examine it and they see how important it was to be this angry because, and they're completely lost in the state as opposed to discovering why this mind state came up, what this is about, how their ego was bruised or whatever. 
so yeah this there's that line of don't push it away to spiritual bypass but there's also the don't indulge in it just because well it makes you feel strong if you indulge in your anger or hatred or fantasize about whatever it is you're you're greedy for so yeah it's it's tricky i mean if the spiritual path were easy we'd all gotten enlightened a long time ago so Yeah, and it's a slow process. The Dalai Lama says you should measure your progress on the spiritual path in five-year increments. We're together here for 10 days. Maybe you learn some techniques, get some good ideas. That's great. But the actual basic change in who you are comes a lot slower than 10 days. And it's just like, okay, I've learned a bunch of things I can do now let me spend some time doing them and so for this practice it's just really being aware of your state of mind i grew up in a family that did not allow negative emotional states or at least the expression of them and i quickly learned that getting angry and upset (laughs) only compounded the problem so i learned to suppress my emotions And by the time I was an adult, I could be really angry about something and have no clue. And somebody asked me, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm I'm fine. (laughs) And luckily I ran into some people that were really good friends and they're like, no, you're not fine. You're angry. No, I'm not angry. Stop telling me I'm angry. (laughs) And they just kept pointing it out to me. And they said, look, the reason you're feeling depressed is you're, suppressing all your anger oh and if they finally got through to me and then i had to learn okay it's really important to know what's going on with my mind state i don't have to be afraid of them my parents aren't going to punish me anymore for getting angry if i'm angry i need to know that i'm angry and then i get on the spiritual path and they tell me uh, again anger is bad so i was smart enough to realize okay It's not going to do any good to suppress the anger. I just have to recognize the anger and deal with the situation. But the only way I'm going to be able to deal with my anger is to know that I'm angry. So it's all about figuring out, all right, what's really going on inside and then acting appropriately. And so the third establishment of mindfulness is to make the habit of checking in and knowing what your mind state is. In this culture, it's really easy to get lost in your job or your entertainment or and never really check in with your mind state. And the, and the Buddha is saying, yeah, it's really important to just periodically be checking in with your mind state. And a really good time to do it is when you're transitioning from one activity to another. One of my uh, friends, when she gets in the car, she just stops and just really gets herself settled before she starts driving. And she's got a little thing, you know, on the dashboard that she reads that, so she's checking in, getting her, she's putting her mind state in in an actually good place. You know, you jump in your car and you're in a hurry, you're already setting yourself up for an accident. So if you just get yourself really collected, it's a good thing. So anytime you change an activity is a really good time to check in with your mind state. Sometimes it's really obvious you're changing your activity because it's generating a negative mind state. And, but other times, yeah, it's just a good time to check in. And you will change your baseline to something more positive, but it's gonna take a while. I hope that's helpful. So I just wanted to follow up because I'm I really appreciate that you said that he's gotten a lot out of that this kind of exploration. So just to clarify, um, I'm getting the sense that you're saying don't spend a lot of time doing this in the middle of the sit because because we're really talking about establishing jhanas or 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 kind of more clear concentration. Because I've found this exploration of mind states to come up and be useful 
at different points in a sit, um, mm -hmm. as long as I'm, I guess, to use your words, using relaxed diligence. Right. Yeah. So there's times when the exploration of mind states is a really good thing to do in a sit. But if you're trying to get concentrated, then you're not going to get concentrated if you're exploring mind states. Unless the mind state is just some hindrance that you can't set aside. And then it may be necessary to, all right, I'm not going to get concentrated until I deal with this. And then you, you work with it. But the general thing for working towards the jhanas is, yeah, everything should be set aside, if at all possible. Just, you know, just set them all aside. But when something's persistent and you can't set it aside, then it may be, all right, this is the time to go explore that. After you're concentrated, whether it be access or jhanas, that could be a really good time to explore mind states. But if you try and explore them and get concentrated at the same time, yeah, you're not going to get the concentration part. Okay, no hands up, so let's move on to the fourth establishment of mindfulness. And this is mindfulness of dharmas. And as I said, dharma is a word that has uh, different translations in different contexts. When it's capital D and singular, it often means the teachings of the Buddha. It might mean doctrine in general. And when it's singular, uh, or when it's plural and a little d, then it might, sometimes it's mind objects, which is often how you see it translated. But uh, in many instances, phenomena would be much better than mind objects. Translators generally want to give one word Oh, every time the Pali word shows up and they seem to have set on uh, mind objects. But, you know, I think it's better to realize this is used in multiple ways. We'll go with phenomena here. And how does one abide contemplating phenomena as phenomena? And the first practice is the five hindrances. Here, what abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena with respect to the five hindrances? How does one do so? If sensual desire is present in oneself, one knows it is present. If sensual desire is absent, one knows it is absent. And one knows how unarisen sensual desire comes to arise. And one knows how the abandonment of arisen sensual desire comes about. And one knows how the non-arising of the abandoned sensual desire in the future will come about. And then the same is repeated for ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse and doubt. Know whether it's present or not. If it's arisen, how did it arise? How can you make it go away? How can you prevent it from arising again in the future? And of course, these last two are the first two of the four great efforts to make an arisen unwholesome state because the hindrances are unwholesome, go away, and then prevent it from coming back. We've talked a lot about the hindrances so far. And the, the whole idea is when a hindrance comes up, you know it's a hindrance. And then you're, if you can just drop it, great. But it may be that you have to figure out, okay, why is this hindrance coming up? What's the trigger behind it? Because that may be, be helpful information for abandoning that hindrance and for preventing it from arising in the future. So we've talked a lot about the hindrances already. Uh, any questions before we move on to the five aggregates? By the way, the hindrances is another of the original practices. What's the difference between uh, this dhamma uh, and uh, a mind state? I mean, hindrances seem to be mind states, right? Yes. So you're, you're doing the practice of knowing your state of mind and you come across a hindrance. So you switch from third establishment to fourth establishment. How did I get myself into this problem? How can I get myself out of this problem? 
how can I prevent getting into this problem in the future? So yeah, the hindrance shows up in the third and you notice it because you're paying attention to your mind states. And then the dealing with it is what you're doing in the fourth. Um, could you give a quick reminder of what's the difference between a hindrance and a defilement? Yeah, a hindrance is a state of mind that has arisen because there's an underlying defilement. The, the essential desire has arisen because underlying you, there's this greed, this seeking of sense pleasures. And then the hindrance is the actual manifestation of that. So uh, the defilement is, is sort of the root cause and we want to pull them out by the roots eventually. But you might know if you have a really bad weed, it, it, sometimes you can't just pull it up, right? You cut it down and it comes up again, but you cut, keep cutting it down and it eventually gets weaker and weaker and then you can pull it up. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're cutting down the hindrances with the hopes that we basically get enough insight so we can eventually pull up the defilement. I'm sorry, I missed what you were explaining um, that about the, you say in exploring how it came in the third and I, I missed no. what you were saying, sorry. In the third, you just notice there's a mind state. And then you're, oh, this is a hindrance mind state. And then you switch to the instructions from the fourth. Okay, how did I get here? How can I make it go away? How can I prevent it from coming back? So this, what's my state of mind? What's my state of mind that you're checking in all day long? Sometimes, yeah, you check in and yeah, I'm peaceful. I'm relaxed. It's good. You don't have to do anything. All right. Or you check in and it's like, I want something. And then you're like, oh, that's a hindrance. Okay. With hindrances, I need to figure out how I got there. And when you say, oh, that's a hindrance, you're now switching to the, the, the practice from the fourth establishment. Identify it, figure out how you got there, figure out how to get rid of it, figure out how to prevent it from coming back. Okay, so moving on to the next practice. Oh, and with the hindrances, yeah, internal, external, arising and passing, etc. The five aggregates. The word aggregate is a translation of kanda, and kanda literally means heap or pile. So if you have a cord of firewood, that's a Kanda of firewood. Again, one abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena with respect to the five aggregates of grasping, the upadana kandas. Upadana is the word we translate as grasping or clinging and kanda aggregate but upadana kanda would be clinging aggregates or grasping aggregates. And it's not that the aggregates are doing the grasping, they're what we're grasping after. But this is a pun. At the time of the Buddha, fire was thought to cling to its fuel. So these are the five blazing aggregates, blazing with the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. Right? The greed, hatred, and delusion, the fuel for them are the five aggregates. We're greedy to get one of these aggregates. We're aversive because we got some aggregate and we don't want it. And we're deluded about these aggregates. We think that they're going to give us lasting happiness or they're an insurmountable problem or whatever we, we have going on. So the aggregates are the fuel for the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. There's a really great book by Tanisaro Bhikkhu. I'm pretty sure it's available online. 
It's called the Mind Like Fire Unbound. And it's a look at the fire similes in the suttas. And yeah, if you're going to do any sutta study, it's going to be really helpful to understand what the worldview was of the people that the Buddha was talking to. And so their understanding of fire shows up all over the place. And so I would highly recommend finding a copy of The Mind Like Fire Unbound and reading it. And it gives you a much better sense of what's going on. So these are the five blazing aggregates. These are the five heaps of firewood for the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. So one abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena with respect to the five upadana khandhas. And how does one do so? Here one thinks such is form, such is the arising of form, such is the disappearance of form or we could say materiality, such as Vedna, such as the arising of Vedna, such as the disappearance of Vedna, such as Sanya, perception, conceptualization, such as the arising of conceptualizing, such as the disappearance of conceptualizing, such as the mental activities, Khandas, uh, sorry, Sankharas, such are the Sankharas, mental activities, such as the arising of mental activities, such as the disappearance of mental activities, such as consciousness, such as the arising of consciousness, such as the disappearance of consciousness. So these are the five khandhas in Pali, Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankhara, and Vijnana. The Rupa one, that's the material world. That's the stuff you can put your finger on. Or, well, you can't put your finger on the moon, but the moon is Rupa. So materiality. And we've talked about Vedna. Sanya is the ability to identify, name, conceptualize your sensory input. So when I hold up the card, and you see the bird and the flowers, you just sanyad, you just conceptualized the bird and the flowers. Because all that's there is colored shapes. But you took the colored shapes and made it into a bird and flowers. It's the same with your TV, right? It's just a bunch of dots. That's all it is, is a bunch of dots winking on and off. But you take the dots and you conceptualize it as, well, whatever TV program you're watching. It's the same as right now. You're conceptualizing me as a bunch of dots on your computer screen. You're taking the sounds in your ear and conceptualizing them as words that have certain meanings. So this is Sanya. And in mental activities. This would be your thoughts, your emotions, your intentions, and your memories. All the mental activity not covered by uh, Vedna, Sanya, or Vijnana, consciousness. And then consciousness, Vijnana. Consciousness is that which knows, right? So look very carefully at the center of my glasses. Look at that black spot right there on my glasses. Look really carefully at it, okay? Now become aware of what's in your peripheral vision. Your, what was in your peripheral vision was there all along. The light was bouncing off of it, hitting your eyes, but you weren't aware of it because you were so fixated on my glasses. But when I called your attention to it, you knew it, you became conscious of it. So consciousness is that which knows. And the, the Buddha says, such is an aggregate, such is its arising, such is its disappearance. We need to pay attention to them. There's a sutta where the Buddha gives similes for the aggregates. He says that form is like a ball of foam. You know, 
a ball of foam that's pretty insubstantial. It's there for a while and then it's gone. Vedna is like a water bubble. He says, think about a heavy rain and a raindrop hits in a puddle and a water bubble appears. It's there for a very brief instance and then it's gone. The Vedna, they're so short lived. I mean, you have some chocolate cake. How many hours of pleasure does it give you to eat one piece of chocolate cake? Six, eight hours of pleasure? Nah. One hour of pleasure? 15 minutes, maybe if you eat it really slowly, right? One bite of chocolate cake gives you pleasure for what? 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute? Yeah. The Vedna are coming and going really fast. Sanya, we conceptualize one thing after another. We're doing it all the time. Anytime our sensory input is changing, we're conceptualizing what's going on. Right now, you're listening to my voice and you're conceptualizing the words. When I speak to you, I have a concept in my head. I convert that concept into words. I flap some loose skin in my throat and make sounds which go into the microphone and then go into my computer and then go over the internet and then come out of your speakers and go into your ear and you conceptualize those sounds, hopefully into something that's fairly close to what I was conceptualizing. When we communicate with somebody, we're busy throwing bits of sanya at them. When you read anything, the words that you're reading, those are bits of sanya, right? This is, this is how we communicate, is throwing bits of sanya, either with our voice or with something that's written down or with a picture. And it's changing all the time. You know, even if you're looking at a static thing, how long do you look at a really beautiful picture and go, oh, this is beautiful? You st stare at that picture for a couple hours? Nah. Five minutes? Eh, probably not. I mean, if it's really detailed, maybe you examine it for five minutes. But each, when you're examining the detail, each one of those bits and pieces is another sanya. They're changing all the time. Such is the arising and passing of mental activities. How long does a thought last? When you remember something, how long do you keep that memory right in the forefront of your mind before something else comes along? Coming and going all the time. And your consciousness, it's always jumping from object to object to object. I mean, when you're trying to meditate and you're put your consciousness on your breathing. It's really hard to keep it there. And when you finally do, yeah, it generates some concentration and then you shift your consciousness, your awareness to the pleasant sensation. And then the PT comes and you shift your attention to the PT Sukha experience and you're just shifting your consciousness all the time. The Sanya is like a mirage. The mental activities are like a banana tree trunk. Do you know banana trees? Big trunk like this, totally hollow. If you have a machete, you can cut it down with one whack. And consciousness is a magician's trick. Foam, water bubbles, mirages, empty tree trunks, and magician's tricks. That's the world we experience. Then we get lost in it. We go running after it. We get afraid of it, etc. Now, sometimes you hear the aggregates talked about as this is what the Buddha uh, deconstructed the psychophysical process into. I would say it's more what the Buddha deconstructed our experience into. We experience the world in terms of rupa in terms of vedna etc rather than uh, an ontological description of the world a cosmological description 
He's saying, yeah, when you're experiencing something, you're experiencing one or more of these aggregates. And this is a useful way to divide them up. Because when we sense anything, there's contact. Contact is the coming together of three things, the sense object, the sense organ, and the sense consciousness. So these first two are rupa and then consciousness. They come together, that's contact. It's followed by Vedna, that's within a tenth of a second. And then we conceptualize what the sensory input is. And that can be very quick, or maybe if we can't tell what we're looking at or hearing, it may take several seconds, or maybe even longer. And then we start cogitating over it. We think about it, emotions come up, we have memories triggered by it, we set our intention dependent on that sensory input. So this contact, the coming together of rupa and consciousness, followed by vedna, sanya, and sankara, is basically what's going on with our senses. This is, this is our world of experience. And it's all changing very rapidly. I want to share a sutta with you that talks about the khandas and why they're so important. This is in the middle length discourses and it's number 109. It's the greater discourse on the full moon night. Thus have I heard. Once the Blessed One was living in Savati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Miagra's mother. On that occasion, on the full moon night, the Blessed One was seated in the opening surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus. So the tradition was that on the full moon and the new moon, the Buddha and his disciples would sit up all night and meditate. Considering that in India, you know, <laughs> In the hot season, it's 120 degrees during the day, and it cools off to, you know, maybe the upper 90s at night. Uh, yeah, much better time to meditate than, you know, when it's 125 or something out. So it makes sense. Then a certain bhikkhu rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe on one shoulder, and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One, said, Venerable Sir, I would... Ask the Blessed One about a certain point, if the Blessed One would grant me an answer. Sit down on your seat, Bhikkhu, and ask what you like. So the Bhikkhu sat down and said, Are these not, Venerable Sir, the five clinging aggregates, that is, material form, Vedana, Sanya, Sankaras, and consciousness? Yes, monk, these are the five aggregates. Good, Venerable Sir. But Venerable Sir, in what are these five aggregates affected by clinging rooted? Where's the clinging come from, basically? These five aggregates are rooted in desire. Usually we think of it as craving, but as I said, sometimes craving and desire are used synonymously. And sometimes you're experiencing an aggregate and it's not really any craving. You just... Yeah, you're, you're just looking for them and uh, just hanging on to it. You, you'd be willing to let it go. So desire may be a better word here. Venerable Sir, is that clinging the same as the five aggregates or something different? Because that clinging is neither the same as, nor, or is it something apart from the five aggregates? It is desire and lust in regard to the five aggregates that there is clinging. So we want them. We're, we desire it. We're, we're, we're desiring it enough that it becomes craving. That's the lust part. But venerable sir, can there be diversity in the desire and lust? There can be bhikkhu. Here someone thinks, may my material form be thus in the future. May my vedna be thus in the future. My perceptions my mental activities, my consciousness. But venerable sir, in what way does the term aggregate apply to the aggregates? Bhikkhu, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the material form aggregate. And the same is said for each of the others. 
past, future, present, internal, external, gross, subtle, inferior, superior, far or near. Venerable Sir, what is the cause and condition for the manifestation of each of these aggregates? The four great elements are the cause and condition for the manifestation of the form aggregate. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of Phaedna. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of perception. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of mental activities. Nama Rupa, name and form, is the cause and condition for the manifestation of consciousness aggregate. We had that last night, that consciousness arises dependent on Nama Rupa, as well as on having an object, a Sankara, and as well as sensory input. But here it's the Nama Rupa. Now we get to the important bits. Venerable Sir, how does identity view come to be? Here, Bhikkhu, an untaught ordinary person who has no regards for noble ones and is unskilled in their discipline in Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or material form as in self or self as in material form or the same for each of the other aggregates. Either is it or possesses the aggregate or the aggregate is in self or the self is in the aggregate. So sometimes we identify with the body. If you're sick, you say, I'm sick. And so now you've identified with the body that's ill, right? Okay, so I am the body. And sometimes we possess the body. This is my hand. I possess this hand. So now I'm, I'm the possessor of the aggregate. And the Vedna I'm feeling from the cool breeze blowing on my face, that's my Vedna. I possess that Vedna. Or material form as in self. We don't do that one too much, but we do the others. The Vedna, that's inside of me. The Vedna I'm experiencing is in my head or in my hand or wherever. The, the thoughts, the thoughts are in my head. The emotions are in my heart. So the, the Sankara aggregate is in me. Or as self in an aggregate. My self is inside of me. It sits behind my eyeball, right? The self is in an aggregate. And we switch back and forth all the time and never notice it. You know, I'm sick. My temperature is bad and it gives me unpleasant feelings, right? So first I'm the body. Now I'm possessing the unpleasant Vedna. I think that I have a cold. I am possessing the illness, right? I, you know, we just, we're just switching around all the time, our relationship to these aggregates and identifying with them like crazy. Anyway, any of in 20 different ways as either it exactly possessing it in it or it in me. But venerable sir, how does identity view not come to be? Here, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in the Dhamma, and who has regard for true men and skilled and disciplined to their Dharma, doesn't do that. Right? Is not identifying with the aggregates in any way. The problem isn't that we're identifying with the wrong thing. It's the act of identification itself that's wrong. There is no right object to identify with. It's the act of identifying that's a mistake. Venerable sir, what is the gratification? What is the danger? What is the escape in the case of each of these aggregates? The pleasure and joy that arises dependent on an aggregate, this is the gratification in the case of that aggregate. 
So the Buddha is not denying that there's pleasure and joy. He's not denying that the aggregates bring us pleasure and joy. But that's the danger. That, that's the, the uh, attraction. That's the gratification. The danger is all of these aggregates are impermanent, dukkha, and subject to change. Whatever gratification you're getting from an aggregate, yeah, it's temporary. And if you're clinging to it when it changes, you're going to experience dukkha. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for these aggregates, this is the escape in the case of each of these aggregates. Right? So, yeah, they bring gratification, they bring pleasure. Just don't do the desire and lust thing. Appreciate the pleasure when they bring the pleasure. And when it's gone, it's gone. No big deal. All right? That's what the Buddha is recommending. But we get attached. We're wanting to get it. We're craving to get it. And once we got it, we're hanging on to it. We're clinging so tightly, it becomes a clinging aggregate. All right? We've set the pile of wood on fire with the greed, hatred, and delusion fires. Venerable Sir, how does one know, how does one see, so that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, there's no eye-making, mind-making, underlying tendency to conceit. The underlying tendency to conceit is really the underlying tendency to conceive of a self. So, how should one see that in regard to this body, rupa, and this mind, consciousness is used here as synonymous with mind, and all the other stuff that's going on, there's no tendency to create a sense of self, no eye-making, no mind-making, no tendency to conceive a self. Bhikkhu, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, one sees all material form as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And the same for all of the other aggregates. One sees it with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Then in the mind of a certain bhikkhu, this thought arose. So it seems material form is not self, bedna are not self, conceptualizing is not self, mental activities are not self, consciousness is not self. What self then will actions done by the not self affect? Okay, if there's nobody here, who gets the results of karma? I mean, he had an elaborate way of saying that, but that's what's going on. All right. If, if, if I can't find a self, who gets the results of karma? Then the Blessed One, knowing in his mind the thought in the mind of that bhikkhu, addressed the bhikkhus thus. It is possible that some misguided man here, obtuse and ignorant, with his mind dominated by craving, might think he can outstrip the teacher's dispensation thus. So it seems each of these aggregates is not self. What self then will actions done by the not self affect? Now, bhikkhus, you have been trained by me through interrogation on various occasions in regard to various things. Uh, you might not have found that a terribly satisfying response. There's a footnote. The readings of this sentence are highly divergent in different editions. So the Pali Canon, there's different editions of it. I believe there's two editions in Sri Lanka and one in Burma and one in Thailand. There's four editions. I can't remember who has the two editions. Okay. So, yeah, sometimes they're, most of the time they're exactly identical, but some of the stuff is slightly different particularly stuff that's a little bit hard to understand. You know, when it was being preserved, it, you know, somebody decided to edit it and make it a little clearer. 
which of course now we don't know what the original said. The same sutta appears in Samyutta Nikaya 22.82, and the reading there seems preferable to the reading here. The translation here follows the Samyutta text. Bhikkhu's Nanamoli trans, Bhikkhu Nanamoli's translation, based on a different version, reads, Now Bhikkhu's, you have been trained by me in dependent conditionality in various instances. Neither version is idiomatic. Pali and the commentaries to both Nikayas are silent. I think what the Buddha is saying here, Bhikkhus, I've taught you to look at the world in terms of dependently originated phenomena. Right? So, like last night, Sati thought his consciousness transmigrates, and the Buddha goes, no, it's a dependently originated phenomena. If you understand dependent origination deeply, you won't be wondering, did I exist in the past? Will I exist in the future? It just disappears. It's the same thing here. If you really get the dependently originated processes creating this sense of self and that there is no real self to be found, then you don't ask who gets anything. There isn't a who. There's just streams of dependently originated processes interacting. That's all that's going on. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent, sukha or dukkha? Dukkha, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent, dukkha and subject to change fit to be regarded? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, I mean, you don't want to identify with your body because, well, yeah, body's kind of wearing out here. I, I, I want to be something that's, you know, a little more reliable than this body that's wearing out. So yeah, probably not a good idea, right? And the same is said for each of the other aggregates, permanent or impermanent, the impermanent venerable sir, sukha or dukkha, dukkha venerable sir, is it fit to regard what is impermanent, dukkha and subject to change to be me, mine, myself? No venerable sir. Now this points out the fact that the self that the Buddha is saying, not self about. That self is the self that is permanent and happy. That's the kind of self we want. It may not be happy right now, but you know, at some point, you know, like when I get to heaven, then it's going to be happy forever, right? So we're looking for some part of me, some essence here that's permanent, not going to go away, and it. If it's not totally happy now, at least it's going to get happy eventually and be permanently happy. That's what we're looking for. And the Buddha's going, you can't find that. You look at these five aggregates and they're definitely not fit to be regarded as me or mine or my soul, myself. Seeing thus a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with Vedana, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with mental activities, disenchanted with consciousness. Now the word disenchantment means disenchanted. We are currently enchanted. We're under the spell of these aggregates. If I can just get the right and you can fill in the blank there, but it's going to be one of these aggregates, the right job, the right house, the right person, the right internet connection, the right whatever it is, I'm going to be happy. We are under that spell. If we can break that spell, if we can become disenchanted by seeing clearly, then we're on our way because being disenchanted one becomes dispassionate. Dispassion is a translation of viraga. Raga means to color. You, you know the Indian musical form raga? A raga is meant to color your mind. 
right? And so viraga would be not colored. Your mind is not colored by your clinging to an aggregate. Think of a toy that you had as a child that had it gotten lost, you would have been horribly upset. You were passionate about that toy. It colored your mind. And now uh, you probably don't even know where that toy is, right? And if, if you do know where it is and it were to disappear, you, you wouldn't be very upset, right? You're no longer passionate about it. Think about walking down the street and you see somebody wearing the colors of the enemy team. And you immediately hate this person because they support that other team, right? Your mind is colored by your passion for that team. And you see this person, you have no idea who they are, but you immediately have a total judgment that they have to be a terrible person because they're supporting the wrong team, right? This is what raga is. It colors our mind. So once we break the spell about these aggregates, we're not expecting them to give us lasting happiness or to be who we are, then our minds are no longer colored. Through dispassion, one's mind is liberated. When it is liberated comes the knowledge. It is liberated. One understands. Birth is ended. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's nothing further here. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, while this discourse was being spoken through not clinging, the minds of 60 bhikkhus were liberated from the asavas. Right at the beginning, you used a word, I believe it was upadana. 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 What again does that mean? clinging but it also can mean blazing in the sense that fire clings to its fuel so upadana kanda would be clinging kanda or blazing kanda and it's a pun we cling to things because we've set them on fire with the fires of greed hatred and delusion So you made that little joke at the end, but actually it, it actually raises an, a question, which I find kind of interesting, which is that like in um, sort of Zen traditions and some other traditions, you know, blazing insight happens when some seemingly mundane thing, like a pebble hits a tree and then all of a sudden the whole veil falls and you just see it all. Right. And also like in the, in the suttas, it's saying, you know, the Buddha gets a discourse and they just hear the discourse and, and, and that's it. They, there was no, nothing further needed. Right. And I guess it, it's just, um, it raises a question in my mind in terms of when insight happens. So we do these practices, concentration practices, insight practices, but then we go about our daily lives. And I guess it's the idea that we're just building we're slowly kind of trying to drop various forms of ignorance and it may just culminate at any given moment. Right. I'm just putting that out there for comment or your reaction to that. Yeah. So I think about the most profound insights I've had and some of them, I was actually sitting and doing meditation, but I've also had a really mind blowing one standing I wasn't meditating or anything. I just was standing there. And I've also had another one that was just completely mind-blowing when I was walking. So, yeah, sometimes they show up when you're doing formal practice. And sometimes they show up at other times. And I've had a lot of insights, not mind-blowing ones that I'm thinking of. But, you know, pretty good insights like dukkha is a bummer. I mean, that's that insight came while I was out for a walk. I was being mindful. I was contemplating dukkha. And, you know, bingo, there it was. Dukkha is a bummer. 
So insights can come at any time. Uh, jhanas, yeah, that's kind of mechanical. You can crank it out. And once you learn what to do, you can sit down, get quiet, and crank out the jhanas. Insights seem to come by accident. But insight practices do make you accident prone. So that's the idea. As for the Buddha giving a discourse and people getting enlightened, I was curious about that too. I was curious mostly about people who would come to the Buddha and say, Venerable Sir, I wish to retire to the forest. Please give me a practice. And I, so I was curious, what practices did he give out? And so when I read the suttas all the way through, I found all of the places where that occurs. And I collected them. They're on a web page on my website, of course, under enlightenment practices. But I also came across all the places where anybody got enlightened, however they got there, and what we know about it. And it turns out there are only 10 discourses where the Buddha gives a discourse and somebody gets fully awakened. There are a number of others where somebody gets to the first stage, stream entry. Okay, but full awakening only happens 10 times when the Buddha gives a discourse. And every single one of those people had done a lot of practice before. It's not some guy coming off the street getting fully awakened. It's bhikkhus for the most part, occasionally somebody from another tradition who's done a lot of practice, like Bahia. Okay, but um, mostly it's people that have been practicing with the Buddha for quite some time. There's two suttas that Sariputta gives where somebody becomes fully awakened. And there's a sutta given by Kemaka where people become fully awakened. So 13 suttas all total. And then there's one where the Buddha gives a discourse and someone gets to the third stage of awakening, but not fully awakened. That person actually didn't have a real long background of practice, but was apparently quite determined. We'll, we'll actually get to that story uh, Thursday night. If, if you're going to hear a discourse and fully become fully enlightened, you got to do a lot of practice beforehand. And you do the practice and yeah, you can crank out the jhanas, you can crank out the concentration, there doesn't seem to be a way to guarantee cranking out the insight. You just do the insight practices and most of the time, yeah, maybe you don't learn much, but occasionally you get life-changing insights. It's worth it because, well, they change your life for the better. So I guess all these uh, experiences, um, you do start craving for them. So that's so you kind of another level you just on a different level to to explore mm -hmm. yeah you get an insight and it's like this is great okay let's keep going because you realize yeah still dukkha happening but it but it's better and you get enough insights and there's noticeably less dukkha happening you, you stop making the stupid mistakes you used to make and so there's less dukkha and so you just keep practicing. Yeah. What is a stream entry? Okay. So the Buddha speaks of four levels of awakening. And stream entry is the first level. It is said that at stream entry, it uproots three of the 10 fetters that bind us to the wheel of samsara. The most important fetter that's uprooted is wrong view of self. So most people believe, yeah, there really is an essence in here someplace. And when you have a stream entry experience, you actually have an experience without there being an experiencer that is so profound that you realize, oh yeah, this sense of self, that's a something that's added on on top of what's really going on. So you no longer have the wrong view of self. Unfortunately, it still feels like you have a self. It's going to take more work to uproot the feeling of self, but at least intellectually, you got it straight now because you've experienced it. It also uproots skeptical doubt. You did what the Buddha told you to do. You got the results he said you were going to get. What's the doubt? 
and it uproots the belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals. You don't think rites and rituals are effective. You can still do them, but you didn't get to this state by lighting candles or doing prostrations or, or whatever. You got it by, yeah, concentrating your mind and investigating reality. Rites and rituals are no longer seen as the path. Most people in Western civilization aren't looking at rites and rituals as the path. We sort of move past that. But maybe your habits, maybe you've got some habit that has become sort of a ritual that you think this will get me awakened. But yeah, once you have stream injury, you see, oh, get there by concentrating the mind and investigating reality. Then the next level, there are two more fetters, passion for pleasure and ill will, uh, often called greed and hatred. And again, one has an experience without an experiencer that's more profound than before. And it weakens both of those, but doesn't uproot them. And then at the third level, one has an even more profound experience without an experiencer, and it uproots the greed and hatred, the passion for pleasure and the ill will. But it still leaves the five higher fetters, which are desire for form, desire for formless. And these are interpreted to mean desire for rebirth in some of the heavenly realms, but it just says desire for form, desire for formless. And ignorance, restlessness, and conceit. Conceit means conceiving of a self. And that's the key one. When you uproot that, then uh, there's no basis for craving anymore because there's nobody there that wants to get anything. And there's no basis for restlessness anymore because there's nobody there to be restless. And there's no ignorance anymore because you're not ignoring the fact that way back at stream entry, you saw there wasn't anybody there, but you keep feeling like it because you're no longer conceiving of a self and that's full awakening. So that's the four levels of awakening. Thank you. I guess it's justified as having restlessness, ignorance. <laughs> yeah, they're hard to get rid of. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they get reduced along the way. They definitely get reduced along the way. But yeah, until you're fully awakened, there's still going to be some restlessness and you're still going to be ignoring some of the ultimate truths about, yeah, ain't nobody home. Just a um, question in terms of terminology. I know these words are difficult to define, and I believe that I understand consciousness. Um, an object appears and the consciousness rises to meet it, so that there's something to be seen, and then high consciousness arises, that sort of thing. But right. to define consciousness as that which knows, which seemed to me to be closer to awareness. So I didn't know if you could clarify that. Yeah. So the word awareness is not a standard translation of any poly word. So when a teacher talks about awareness, you've got to understand, okay, how do you mean awareness? Are you using awareness as synonymous with consciousness, which is what I tend to do. Gil Fronstel uses awareness as synonymous with mindfulness. It's more like sati, okay? So you really do, if somebody's talking about awareness in a Buddhist context, you've got to figure out, all right, what are they talking about? Furthermore, consciousness in the suttas is not what we would call a well-defined term. It appears in a number of contexts. There's consciousness as one of the five aggregates. There's consciousness as the sixth element. The fifth element is space, and the sixth element is consciousness. There's the six sense consciousnesses. There's consciousness used in synonymous with mind. This body and consciousness, it's being used this body and mind there. Like when we were doing the uh, Samanyapala Sutta at the end. This is my body made of material form, etc., impermanent. And this is my consciousness supported by it and bound up with it which is really, this is my mind 
supported by it and bound up with it. So there's four different ways. It's also used as a fifth way of conscious versus unconscious occasionally. So consciousness is not uh, a strictly well-defined term. And the best I can do is say it's that aspect of your mental activity that registers or knows a sensory input. And so it's a little bit closer to uh, the sixth sense consciousness is, and like you say, more like awareness. Uh, yeah. But it gets used in these other ways as well. So, thank you. I, I have heard it, awareness as like, uh, another word for mindfulness. So that yeah. that's a lot better. Thank you. Yeah, that comes from Gil. So I have two questions. Uh, one uh, is kind of. It just occurred to me, you know, all these suttas about people um, getting awakened. And, and uh, is it worth noting that, do you think that the monks are in a different mental state than we are? <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here on the couch, just kind of listening like I'm at a movie and, <laughs> you know, playing with the cats and stuff. And it strikes me that the monks might might have actually been in a post jhana contemplation or something. So I, I would suspect, remember, they're sitting up on the full moon night. The commentaries tell us that this guy was a, a teacher for these 60 monks who became awakened and he couldn't get them to full awakening. And he's like, OK. I'm going to ask the Buddha about this. And these guys, they're, they're sitting there. You know, they've been meditating for a while, probably. I mean, it doesn't say, but you can, you can, if, if they really truly got awakened, you can figure they were pretty concentrated when this whole discussion took place. So they've been sitting there, meditating, playing with their jhanas, and then the discussion takes place, and it, yeah, blows their minds, and they become fully awakened. So yeah. And they had a really good teacher, you know, they had somebody that was fully awakened up there teaching and knowing exactly what they needed and so forth. So that was probably really helpful as well. And yeah, um, monks today are in a different place than lay people, right? And some of them are in a place that's quite similar to maybe to what the monks were when they were listening to the Buddha. And others, they might be more distracted than you are. But all you really have to worry about is where are you and what can you do to improve your journey on the spiritual path? And yeah, you're a lay person, so how can you lead a lay life that's really supportive of spiritual practice? And then you had a second question? Yes, uh, so thank you. Um, so always gr wrangling with the concept of self and what it is and what it isn't. Um, um, so it strikes me that, you know, okay, I, I think I've seen that all the aggregates are unreliable. There's, there's at least aspects of each one of them that is completely out of my control, whatever that means, um, influenced by other causes and conditions. There are certain things that we commonly say are in our control. Okay, my react, my response to, you know, someone yelling at me. We think that that's in our control. So in a concept where there is no independent self, how do we rationalize those certain things that we do have control of. Another way of putting it before you answer is, is, is there a different way of looking at soda pie with regard to the processes that are happening outside of this, the sphere of this mind body and versus ones that are happening within the sphere of this mind body, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that actually the, there are two perspectives 
the relative and the absolute is usually how it's called, uh, the conventional and the uh, ultimate. And I will talk about that tonight in some detail, but basically to say that sometimes it's very helpful to look at what's going on and yeah, act as though you actually have a self in looking from the conventional perspective. I mean, from the conventional perspective, this is my phone. It's not your phone, it's my phone, right? But actually from the ultimate perspective, yeah, it's just soda pie of a bunch of silicon and plastic and metal and somebody putting it together and all that. But from a relative perspective, it's a phone. It's my phone. So, yeah, some things are better addressed from the relative perspective. I suggest if you're crossing the street, you operate from the relative perspective rather than the ultimate perspective. You don't want to say, uh, that bus is empty and step in front of it. <laughs> Not going to work real well. So, yeah, I would guess that a fully awakened person would automatically shift to the appropriate perspective when any situation comes up. As lay people, we get lost in the conventional perspective and start taking this sense of I'm seeing from here, I only experience touch with my body and think that there's somebody inside and we operate all the time from that instead of actually realizing a much bigger picture that can be seen from the ultimate perspective. I hope that's helpful. And I hope maybe tonight when I talk about relative and absolute perspectives, it'll be even a little more clearer. So I want to ask, so there's no, so we are, the whole time we are creating karmas, good and bad, thought, body, everything. And then they have, there are causes and effects. There are effects from, you know, arising from this. And so there's no self inherit, whatever the results. Right. So there's no self. And there is this, there's no non-self to inherit either. So what we are doing is by causing, by creating this karma, this karma is just creating other conditions, cause effects to give rise to another phenomena like myself or something else. And that's all we are doing. So thinking that uh, karma is a reward or punishment system or a learning process is not the case then. Right. Karma could be a reward or a punishment or a learning thing, okay? But the Buddha said, don't try and figure out the threads of karma. It will either lead to madness or great vexation. And basically, he's not saying there is a self. He's not saying there isn't a self. As we'll see tonight, he says, one with right view does not take a stand about whether there is or isn't a self. One with right view sees there's nothing but dependently originated processes. Okay, uh, the, the solidity of everything disappears, including the solidity of me. It, it's also not there. The karma, that's actions and results. And we do an action and we've changed our minds a bit by just doing the action. It will be easier to do such an action in the future, or maybe it'll be harder when we see the results of it. And it goes out into the environment and it may come back to us quickly over time, never, but it does go out and change the environment. And it's, it sometimes is personal when seen from the relative perspective and sometimes yeah, you just, you don't see any person or anything there. It seems to be more of a group karma. I mean, the United States went and invaded a country in the Middle East. A bunch of oil men went in to steal the oil, right? And the karmic consequences of that are the rise of ISIS and millions of people dead or traumatized and instability. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of very unpleasant results from that action. And that's what we've got to see. So sometimes 
yeah, you do an action and it's coming right back to you. And sometimes you do an action and you have no idea how it plays in the bigger picture. Is that helpful? It's very difficult to understand. It's, yeah. um, it's, it's like, it's, it's mind boggling. You know, like something yeah. I do, it goes uh, to some, you know, it kind of give rise to con certain conditions that create either an object or a situation or something, and there's no self or non-self right. uh, that directly reap the rewards or being punished, you know, just an open kind of thing that in a way I'm, I'm responsible for things. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very, very, it's, it's difficult at the moment. I'm just so, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's basically actions have consequences. And that's all that we really know. We don't know how the consequences are going to play out in many instances. You smile at the clerk at the store. They've been having a bad day. The fact that you smiled at them, it actually gives them some peace of mind. And when they go home, yeah, they're not mean to their kids because you smiled at them. I mean, it may be as simple as that. Or you smiled at the clerk at the store and they're like, what's with this person? Why are they smiling at me? Don't they realize that the world is horrible? And they get even more upset because somebody smiled at them. You never know. But we do know that the things we do with good intention behind them, with kindness behind them, are much more likely to produce the kind of results we'd like to have than those that are motivated by anger or something like that. And so we try and be in a place where our intentions are letting go, loving, compassionate, because whatever actions come from that are just going to be much more beneficial to the world around us. And that's all we can do.